I'm Donald Bates. I'm one of the architects of Federation Square, along with my partner, Peter Davidson. Peter and I started Lab Architecture in 1994, back in London, and we did the competition for Federation Square in 1997. And after having won the competition, we associated with Bates Smart, Architects of Melbourne, and then spent the next five years between 1997 and 2002 building Federation Square. For the competition, the first dates were, I think there were 176 entries from around the world. All but about three or four put the public space actually down on the street across from St. Paul's Cathedral and directly opposite Flinders Street Station. For us, we changed it and actually rotated the space so that instead of running north to south, it runs east to west. And we moved the public space up onto the site. The reason for doing that was we really wanted to bring people onto the site, not just have the public space at the edge of Federation Square. That also allowed us then to have the buildings wrap around and it just meant that we had a really a, a kind of landscape, not just an outdoor garden area, but a true landscape that you walk up and across. And with that, we then decided that's how we would pave it with these Kimberly sandstone. It's also, we think, an incredibly beautiful surface where every single cobblestone has a story and a coloration and a tonality that changes across it. And it means that we have this, this sort of meandering color field that, that shifts and changes. And it's part of a larger artwork by Paul Carter called Niram Nu. And so the ground itself is part of an artwork as you walk on it and as you move across it. The building back here, the Yara building, was not part of the competition, but we added it because we wanted to have that ability to activate it with the, the spaces and the cafes and restaurants in the lower area, but we also wanted it to frame the plaza. The building here, which is part of the transport building and has the big stage, was also not part of the competition. And we added that, one, because we wanted to activate this corner, really important corner where Princess Bridge starts and the river is, but we also wanted to have this stage and the big video screen. But just as importantly, we put this building here to block the wind. There's a lot of wind that comes up the Yarra River from the west coming towards Federation Square. And by having this building here, it meant that we could have the plaza open and be used all year long. We didn't have to worry about the wind creating a big tunnel effect that was in here. The building that's over to my right is the Alfred Deacon building, but it's actually made up of two different institutions. So you have SBS, the Special Broadcasting Service, who have their broadcasting and recording studios here. And then you have the ACMI, the Australian Center for the Moving Image. And these two join together and share the space, but have their own distinct identity within the building. So the ACMI includes cinemas, it includes a big multimedia gallery, which is actually occupying one of the previous train platforms of Princess Bridge. Further beyond, we see the atrium. So we see the north side of the atrium across, and then coming through it is the crossbar, the dark blue perforated metal screen that you have. And this is really an element that makes that connection both into the NGV, but also as the administrative offices for Federation Square. I've spoken before about the overall design of Fed Square having to do with what we call coherence and difference. That same idea went through to the facades. So the development of this facade, which is based on a tiling system developed by a mathematician, Joseph Conway, called the Conway Pinwheel Grid. And what it allowed us was to have a singular facade system on most of the buildings, yet that also allows for a lot of difference and variation. So we could articulate the differences between the buildings and what roles they had. So the system is very simple. It starts with what we call a tile. So this triangle here happens to be in sandstone here. It could be in zinc, could be in glass, could be in perforated zinc. You put five of these tiles together, exactly the same tile, and it makes another self-similar triangle. So the same triangle, same proportions, but of a bigger size. Then you take five of these, what we call panels, you put five of those together and it makes a mega panel. And each panel is made of one material, 
but joined together in the mega panel, it could be any of the four materials that we use. And it allows us to create an array of different configurations, different relationships of materials, so that the NGV building that we're looking at now is very different from the ACMI building or the SBS building or the Yara building. Same materials, same systems, same structural conditions, but a different pattern which helps to create the variety in such. Even though the Conway pinwheel grid is very mathematically defined. One of the things it allowed us was to have a facade that's not just a rectangular box. There's a moment in the Conway grid where certain alignments take place and they become fold lines. And during the design process, we would sometimes find that the pipes were bigger than we originally anticipated. So we have to push the facade out and fold it to be able to hide those pipes. So the facade as you go around the building is not just an extrusion from the ground up to the sky. It actually bends and folds to accommodate and to compensate for some changes that came later. The area we're in is, we really called it St. Paul's Forecourt because it's looking towards the cathedral. And we thought that was a really important aspect of having finally built over the railways and for the first time ever having a sort of ground on which to stand directly in front of the cathedral. But it's also the address to Federation Square. It's the address that goes across to Flinders Street Station and obviously the continuation of Swanston Street. And so it really wanted to be that space that brought people in, but also a place where people could collect and wait for friends. So it becomes the new sort of destination. I mean, we've talked about it as the sort of homepage uh, at a website, that this is the place you go to and then navigate elsewhere after you've met, discuss what you want to do, or just do some of the events that are here at Federation Square. One of the aspects about the atrium was we had this idea that one of the things missing in Melbourne was this linkage from the city, the CBD, down to the Yarra River. And in a certain way, it's a continuation of the laneways like Hosier Lane, which is just across Flinders Street from us. But another important part about the design of the atrium is that when you look towards the, the NGV, the front entrance, in fact, the foyer of the NGV is actually part of the atrium. So as part of that design, it was also fundamental that there was no front door. That is to say, it couldn't be locked or closed. So in a way, it is a public domain. It's a public space. It's a public street, a covered street that takes you from the city and down to the riverside. The structure that you see here is what we might call a space frame, but it's an irregular space frame. And that a regular space frame is every element is the same dimension and forms a kind of geometric grid. Our grid is actually based on the triangle, the same as the facades of the buildings at Fed Square. It may look very chaotic when you first see it, but in fact, there's only seven different shapes of glass, and they're all made up of the triangular shape joined together in different configurations. So glass on the inside and glass on the outside is a kind of what we call a solar chimney, which the heat is captured inside, and as it heats up, it rises up and is taken out of vents up above. Because we didn't want to have a front door, we couldn't necessarily just have refrigerated air, chilled air in here. So we developed the Labyrinth, which is a passive cooling system, which sits underneath the, the plaza surface, but above the railways on the structural deck. And it acts as a way of gathering cool during the night and then releasing that through the air. And the air comes up in these grills that are placed throughout the atrium. As that cool air comes up and as it warms up, it's also taken out through the roof. This is the, what we really called the, the South Atrium. It's now called the Edge, but it's really a continuation of the North Atrium. In the atrium, right where the seating starts at the upper level, it's up until that point from the north to the south that we have to have clearances above the railway lines. But from that point, we could start to step down. And so we had this aspiration of using this part of the building as a way to make that connection down to the riverside. 
Originally, we thought this would maybe be a place where there might be some lunchtime concerts, there might be a cafe up here. But as we were designing it again, using the same structural system with the portal frame and then the two layers of glass, our acoustics engineers were saying, well, if we started to allow the glass to fold in or to be open, we could actually acoustically tune this space. It's actually now able to house the chamber orchestra music. But importantly, it's also as a public space for public discourse. In the design, as I said before, originally it was just a kind of space where some things might happen, but once we started designing it for concerts, for other events, we ended up with 269 seats that are here permanently, that are part of the design, and then we can add some more so that we have a full capacity of about 450 people in this space. Here along the River Terrace, it's really at the southern boundary, the southern edge of Federation Square proper. But it's where it makes that connection between Federation Square down to the Yarra. And in fact, we're walking on the terrace is actually above the vaults. So there are these bluestone vaults underneath us, which were storage places originally, but now have been converted into cafes, restaurant, bicycle rental, and so forth. One of the major design aspects we felt with Federation Square was this notion of permeability, that it's not just a big solid building you go into, but it's actually a series of buildings that you pass between. We don't assume that everybody that comes to Federation Square is coming necessarily to stop there. They may just be passing through to the river's edge, down to Bir Rang Mar, to the footy, and to the tennis on beyond. So really, Federation Square is both a destination, but it's a kind of network and a nexus of people moving through and passing through. One of the complicating aspects of building Federation Square is that we're building over the railway lines. I mean, this was at its time the largest structure built over railway lines in Australia. The complication was that because the railway had to keep running, it meant that they could really only work in the middle of the night. So sometime after one o'clock, after all the electricity was turned off of the lines, until about five o'clock in the morning when they had to turn the electricity back on again. So they only had a very small window of opportunity to be able to do the structure and put the beams and the concrete deck. Once they had that, then we had a ground to work off of. In fact, I got married on Federation Square when the deck was still being made. So in my wedding photographs, you can see parts of the deck, but you can also see the trains going through at the same time. One of the other complications in the deck and in building it was that as part of the tenancies, we have the Australian Centre for the Moving Image, which has theatres, cinemas, some of the highest quality cinemas in Australia because they show silent movies. And so acoustically, it has a very high rating. Also as part of the Alfred Deacon building is SBS, radio and television, where they have recording and broadcasting studios, which also require very high acoustic systems. So those, that building, the Alfred Deacon building, which is really two buildings joined together, are all resting on massive springs, which is to dampen the vibrations that come from the trains running underneath. If you had a choice, you wouldn't build these facilities necessarily above working railway lines, but there was a way to solve it through engineering in terms of the springs to dampen it. In 1997, when Peter Davidson and I and the rest of the team were told that we would won Federation Square, we could come to the site and it was almost like what's behind me now. It was a big open area with the rail lines running about eight meters below where we're standing now. It's a bit hard to believe, but in 2019, Federation Square became a heritage site, one of the youngest, if not the youngest, heritage listed site in Victoria, perhaps in Australia. It's an incredible accolade for a project, a contemporary project, still in its sort of youth, but I think that's as much a recognition of what was accomplished in the design and the construction and all of the big teams that worked on it as well as it's an acknowledgement of the role it plays in the cultural and social life and civic life of Melbourne and of Victoria, and in fact of Australia. In the future, this site will probably be developed, whether that's an extension of Federation Square itself in terms of its activities and facilities, 
or whether it has another role culturally or socially or in terms of some of the development of Melbourne itself. We have the infrastructure of roads and highways and trains and trams, but we also have an incredible cultural infrastructure. And it's being expanded as part of a new formulation called the Melbourne Arts Precinct, of which Federation Square will become part of. That includes the Hamer Hall, the State Theatres, the NGV International, and also the new NGV Contemporary. It's always been that way already at Federation Square. Federation Square itself is an ensemble, is a precinct of NGV, of ACMI, of SBS, of the Curry Heritage Trust, and of all the social activities and public activities that take place. I think one of the successes of Fed Square is that it operates all the time for all kinds of people. It's inclusive, it's open, and there's always something new to discover that's taking place there.